As strange as it may seem to us in these days, there was a time upon this world, not so long ago, when our atmosphere suffered no pollution, when the landscape was not crisscrossed by highways, and no forests were laid flat to accommodate urban sprawl. There was even a time, not so long ago, that the first report of a gunshot or explosion of a bomb had not been heard, and the world had never seen nor dreamt of a war. This was an era of great biodiversity, the era of the megafauna, when the largest animals ever seen upon this earth lived, apart from the time of the dinosaurs. The glaciers of the most recent ice age were in retreat, and vast coastal lands as large as entire modern nations existed along the edges of the continents, but they are long gone, buried by the sea. In this time, when the world was unbelievably different, robust and full of life, yet more still and calmer, two relatively new species walked upon this earth, both very intelligent, both highly social, for they had learned to share the strength of their clans to survive. These were humans and wolves, who hundreds of thousands of years ago were kindred spirits, though they did not know it yet. In part three of this three-part series, we will look at the specific psychology of wolves that enabled them to become dogs and drew humans and dogs into such a tight alliance. But in today's episode, we will focus on the nature of the world that created the alliance between wolves and humans that ultimately culminated in the profound bond that exists between modern humans and modern dogs. A bond so strong that from the moment a dog's pups are born, before they can even open their eyes from their very first moments, the smell of a human elicits the strongest reaction from them. A bond so strong that humans, vastly cognitive creatures driven by thought and reason more than any other animal that has ever lived on this earth insofar as we know, think of dogs as family members the strongest sort of bond that can exist within a pack. These feelings are so strong, in fact, that for most cultures and most humans around the world, the eating of a dog is aberrant, considered on a par with cannibalism, and in my opinion, rightly so. The anthropological record indicates that the wolf-human alliance began to occur about 40,000 years ago. I honestly believe the alliance occurred even before then, because, as I mentioned in the previous episode, Having spent time living in the deep wilds with a wolf, I found the psychological characteristics essential to forming the wolf-human bond to be already fully present in that wolf. But that aside, if we take a look, we discover that about 40,000 years ago was a very busy time in the history of the world. Modern humans had reached Europe, and we were seeing crucial early developments in the formation of technology, competition between humans and their cousins Neanderthals, and permanent and semi-permanent camps, the first rudimentary beginnings of modern civilization and agriculture, and considerable changes to the global environment. This was a world fraught with danger, filled with challenges, and yet of dazzling, amazing beauty, and what must have seemed at the time to be boundless plenitude. And it was this world that brought humans and wolves together. The Pleistocene era began about 2.5 million years ago, and it is sometimes called the era of the megafauna, because it was a time in the world when huge animals once again came to dominate the landscape. Not since the time of the dinosaurs had such immense creatures been so much a part of the ecosystem. Some of those creatures in a somewhat evolved form survive into the modern world. Horses, rhinoceroses, hippopotami, but some, sadly, are gone from this earth. The mammoth and the mastodon, the giant sloths, cave bears, and saber-toothed tigers, to name but a few. But it was during this era that the gray wolf, Canis lupus, evolved. The gray wolf is the ancestor of all modern dogs. This was also the period of time in which humans evolved, and during the Pleistocene, there were many variations or species of our kind. Gromagnons, Denisovans, Neanderthals, the Red Deer Cave People, and latest onto the scene, Homo sapiens, us. The modern human. And throughout this time, wolves were going through their own characteristic evolution, and various species evolved, and perhaps most noteworthy of the extinct wolf species were the dire wolves, larger and more muscular than the gray wolves. But both humans and wolves lived in a world of much larger and far more physically imposing creatures. Mammoths, mastodons, and aurochs traveled in herds and were huge and could be dangerous. Mammoths, just as an example, could weigh up to six tons per specimen. 
Contrary to myth, though, the Homo sapiens of ancient Europe were not mammoth and mastodon hunters. At least, this was not their preferred prey. Mostly, they hunted caribou, though I imagine they would not have been loath to take down such a rich form of nutrition such as a mammoth if given the opportunity. But caribou, or reindeer as they are known in Europe, were of a much more manageable size and much less dangerous to hunt. But even then, those ancient modern humans had to navigate a world that was fraught with perils in the form of giant and extremely capable predators. Even in Europe, their landscape was one of lions and cave lions, grizzlies and the immensely larger cave bear, the huge cave hyena, and even the gray wolf. Many of these predators were considerably larger and stronger than humans, both the more slightly built modern Homo sapiens and even the stouter Neanderthal. And, to be quite blunt, all humans really had going to defend themselves were sticks and clubs, flint and later antler-tipped spears, at laddles and bows. Humans were not particularly good tree climbers. They were not especially fast. They didn't have the range of hearing that their competition did, and in some cases could not compete in acuity of vision. In the ancient world, the disadvantages of the human species are evident in the simple fact that all the other human species are extinct, all except for Homo sapiens, us. And yet we, quite distinct from our kindred in the genus Homo, not only managed to survive, but we have come to dominate this earth and have in fact become the greatest apex predator this world has ever seen. In point of fact, nearly all the species that I have mentioned, no matter how large, powerful, or impressive, are all gone from this earth, some due to climate change, but many by the hands of Homo sapiens. What gave us the edge to survive where such impressive competition did not? Whatever it was, it also worked for the gray wolf, which, like humans, when compared to the predator and prey species of the time, was both small and unimposing. We survived where they didn't because we found and exploited several niches. Communication, coordinated social groups, and high intelligence. Let's take a moment to explore each, and the advantages each imparted to humans and wolves in that dangerous ancient world. Humans, of course, have the capacity for speech. Wolves, too, also have a significant ability when it comes to communication. It is true they cannot make vocal words in the way that humans do. But, as is clearly demonstrated by their descendants, modern dogs, they are very good at receptive communication, which is to say, understanding what is being conveyed to them. This ability is rooted in their complex pack lifestyle, through body language that may consist of tail movements, ear movements, positioning of the head, showing of fangs, crouching, rolling over, and a wide variety of other gestures, wolves are able to communicate with one another, and not in a merely rudimentary fashion as do many other animals. Their communication is sophisticated enough that they can coordinate pack hunts, stalking, running down, and occasionally ambushing prey. By means of this communication, they establish who is going to be the pack leader and who are going to be the pack subordinates. And if this doesn't sound similar enough to the way humans communicate, their social interactions go beyond what is merely profitable for each individual wolf operating within the pack as a whole. For wolves come to care for one another, just as humans living within a family or a community come to care for one another. Wolves take care of their old and their injured. They join forces to feed their young and, like humans, they mourn their dead. Indeed, it can be said that communication and coordinated social structure go hand in hand. The development of each is dependent on the other, and when they co-occur in an intelligent species, they provide an edge in survival. These abilities continue to develop and evolve, culminating in complex social structures and advanced communication techniques. This ability to coordinate allowed both humans and wolves to hunt as packs, and so doing, they were able to deal with the predators in the wild world around them, track down and kill local medium-sized fauna, such as the reindeer of Europe, and when opportunities presented, acquire much larger game, such as aurochs, mammoths, and the huge, now sadly extinct, Irish elk. Being highly intelligent creatures, both wolves and humans were independently able to learn about their environments, as well as the habits of the prey they sought. In so doing, they were able to determine the best places to forage, the best locales in which to survive and thrive, and the best places to find shelter. Of course, human intelligence went even further, as they were able to develop technologies such as herbal medicine and fire. Who knows, though, if wolves had likewise been gifted with dexterous hands and opposable thumbs, they might well have done the same. 
for a wolf's intelligence is not too far different from a human's. What we see is that in this ancient world, a world filled with great creatures, both predator and prey, which could easily physically outmatch both gray wolves and humans, humans had to learn to rely on each other in order to survive, and the exact same thing can be said for wolves. This instinctive sense of mutual dependence ultimately led to the trait of hypersociability. That's the ability to extend feelings of bonding beyond one's social circle or species. In humans, this likely occurred through rare meetings between clans, and sometimes those clans weren't quite of the same species, such as when Homo sapiens met Neanderthals. And for wolves, this is innate to the way their packs grow and spread. For when the numbers within a pack become too numerous to be supported by the resources within the pack's environment, certain wolves will break off from the pack, wander and join other wolves, ultimately forming a new pack of their own. Thus, this ancient world would have prepared both humans and wolves to be receptive to outsiders and to species of high intelligence and skilled at reading social cues who value virtues such as altruism and loyalty. It just seems natural they should be drawn together. And there was something else, I believe, a certain je ne sais quoi, which enabled humans and wolves to become adept at reading each other's body languages. Other animals also produce body languages. I work with horses. And horses give a number of tells as to what's on their mind. But compared to dogs and humans, those tells are but a shadow. Or maybe I just think that way because dogs and humans have been together for so long that at this point we are genetically naturally adept at reading one another. But we got to be very, very good at understanding each other. Enough in fact that ancient humans soon discovered that wolves could assist them in their hunts and even help guard their encampments as well as providing valuable companionship at any time and wolves soon found it was beneficial to hang around those humans. They shared their food and the warmth of their fires, and wolves, raised in proximity to those early human camps, must have had a greater chance of survival. For indeed, there are far more dogs in the world today, the direct descendants of wolves, than there are pure wolves. And in the immense challenges of the late Pleistocene era, joining clans allowed wolves and humans to combine their strengths. The prey that humans and wolves sought was large and could be dangerous and the enormously powerful and capable predators of the era could be absolutely lethal. Wolves would have helped humans detect their presence in an area by dint of their superior hearing and ability to smell. And humans, with their higher intelligence, better ability to spot camouflaged objects or animals in the visually complex field of the ancient landscape, and with their even more advanced coordinated hunting techniques and weapons, were able to provide superior protection. And in the harshness of long hunts, Far away from the camp in a world where there were less than a million humans on the entire planet, where one could go days or weeks without seeing another person, social, loyal, and friendly wolves would have provided much welcome company. The late Pleistocene era, in particular, would have pressured relatively small and weak animals such as gray wolves and humans to develop the complex social abilities and life structure required to survive, and those social abilities would likewise have required high intelligence. Thus, it was only natural that both wolves and humans, dependent on very similar strategies, would evolve greater and greater cognitive capacities. And thus, the harshness of this ancient time, when gray wolves and early humans were outmatched in almost every way, was exactly the right setting to create the alliance between humans and wolves, an alliance that persists to this very day, among the many, many dog and human families in the world. By dint of our co-evolution, we are natural allies. And because we fit together so well, we are natural friends. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.